Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to feel better, overcome fear and anxiety, and radically transform your life and the lives of those around you, then do we have the HeartMath Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Howard Martin, one of the leaders and founders of HeartMath, co-author of The HeartMath Solution, and a contributing author to a brilliant book on coherence, Heart Intelligence. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about connecting with the intuitive guidance of our hearts for greater health, reduced stress, and a happier, healthier humanity. That plus we'll talk about touching strangers, mamas and babies, coherence in the workplace, dollar stores and the lottery, Josh and Mabel, Dr. Ellen Girk and a horse, and what in the world ordering a humble runabout Bentley or Rolls Royce has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Howard. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready to do it, Michael. Thanks for having me. Let me see if I can do you right now. I'm ready to shine. There Woo-hoo! we go. <laughs> I got it. And well, we were actually... Back. Thank you very much. We were practicing just a little bit of heart coherence beforehand. We, we've got another interview where we can get Howard Martin 101. What is heart math? Heart math. How do you get involved? Okay. Heart math is a system. Uh, consisting of uh, methods, techniques, and technology. It's all underpinned with with really cool scientific research. Mm -hmm. And it was designed very caringly to help empower us through these changing times, these extraordinary times that we live in. A lot of ways to get involved. We have training programs. We certify people. We have really cool technology products. Of course, they're the books and things that you mentioned. Um, Newsletters, the the whole deal, you know, and so it happens all over the world. We have people all over the planet that are part of uh, of HeartMath and part of our big extended family. So let's let's go and let's talk a little bit about heart coherence. So before the interview, I asked Jessica, my wife, she's the producer. I said, is there anything you want me to ask Howard about? And she goes, why don't you sit down with me? And I want you to breathe in gratitude through the heart and breathe out love. Let's just do this at the breakfast table for a moment. And so we did it for about 10, 20 seconds. That's it. And she's like, now tell me how you feel. And she said, that's what I want you to ask Howard about. About why you feel that way. About why we felt so good after sitting together and getting into coherence. Well, a couple of reasons. Let me just take an interesting angle on it. And then I'll break down some science about it. Um, you know, it's interesting. We have this part of ourselves that's called heart, you know, this magnificent intelligence that we have inside. And it doesn't take but a few seconds of connecting with that before things begin to feel different. It's amazing. You know, and the changes that can occur uh, by just adding a little heart to anything that we do, um, we can feel that. I think part of the reason we feel it, not necessarily so much you and your wife, mm-hmm. but people today move so fast. They live from the neck up. They're disconnected from this part of themselves. And so they just sort of run through the the, the mental and emotional patterns of daily life, trying to keep up with the, you know, with all the speed that's happening you know, in their lives and around them. And when they slow down just long enough and say, let me make a connection with this other part of myself, mm-hmm. it feels different. And the difference can be profound. And so there's a difference that you experience when you just drop in there for, you know, 10 to 20 seconds, because it's, it's, it's there all the time, but it's something that we just don't contact um, with enough. When you do that, Uh, Some things are happening inside the body. You know, uh, I don't know how far down the science rabbit hole we want to go today. Go as far down as you'd like. I'd love a little science today. Okay, sure. Well, what we know from our scientific research here at HeartMath, and I mentioned that everything that we do is underpinned with science. So we understand the physical heart differently, and we've been pioneers in, uh, in changing the paradigm of understanding our physical heart. Rather than seeing the physical heart as just a blood pump, we now know that it's an information processing center in the body that it sends information to the brain and throughout the entire system. It does it in a variety of ways in biological function, brain function, every aspect of who we are at a physiological level is dependent upon these signals. Mm -hmm. The heart is like a master synchronizer of so many of the biological functions occurring in the body. Now, when you shift into the heart like you did, you focus in the area of the heart, you, you breathe as if the breath is coming in and out through this area, and that's called heart-focused breathing. And then you activate a regenerative, uplifting emotion, the kind of emotions associated with the concept of heart, like love, care, mm-hmm. kindness, appreciation, those type of emotions. What happens is your physiology actually starts to change instantaneously. The nervous system becomes more synchronized. The communication that goes from the heart back to the brain through a nervous system that exists in the heart improves. 
That opens up the higher perceptual centers of the brain. As that's taking place, hormones are being released into your system that are regenerative for you in greater amounts. Hormones like oxytocin, DHEA, uh, begin to increase. All of that ends up in a, uh, an experience to where you feel usually more clear, more calm, more peaceful, often less stress. Sometimes there can be a lift in physical energy, a regenerative type of feeling that's occurring as those physiological changes are occurring. And in essence, you can just feel better fast. And that happens by just focusing in your heart. It, it goes back to an old statement that we've heard all of our lives about a change of heart changes everything. Mm -hmm. And the science supports that right on down to the physiological communication going on between heart, brain, and the rest of the body. So let's, let's talk about that connection. Thank you so much for, for giving us that overview. Let's talk about what is the heart putting out and is it really more powerful than the brain? Well, the heart puts out a lot. First of all, the neurological communication that I mentioned is studied through a field called you know, neurocardiology. Mm -hmm. In our heart, we have a nervous system. Next to the brain, it's the most complex part of the nervous system that we have. And it's sending information, neurological information you know, to the brain, right? So that's one way. Um, I mentioned the hormones that get released. Uh, there are some hormones actually produced by the heart. One is called atrial peptide. It reduces the release of the stress hormone cortisol. Uh, the heart produces a lot of what's called oxytocin, which is generically called a love hormone. It's actually being produced by the heart, you know, in, in large amounts. So that's all happening at the same time. The other way is where it gets really cool. And you have a picture of that behind you right now. And it's the heart's energetic communication. When we go to a doctor, and I was at a doctor the other day, and I was explaining this to the woman that was doing my, my EKG, and she was like, first of all, amazed, and then she got it, because I was explaining that the heart is an electrical organ, and I said, you're measuring my EKG right now. What are you measuring? I'm measuring electricity, she says. I said, you're exactly right. The heart produces enough electricity that it creates an electromagnetic field, and it's a picture of that field behind you right now in your shot. This field... Um, it goes to every single cell in our body, for starters, but it also extends beyond our skin out into space. Uh, it can be measured about three to four feet outside the body. Now, this is not an aura. It's not a subtle energy field. It's very measurable electromagnetic energy, like radio waves, that are being emanated from the heart. Now, I'm not discounting subtler fields than this one, but this is a, a field you can measure with very traditional um, research equipment. It's called magnetrometers. So you measure this field and you can see it's outside the body about three to four feet. Now, it goes into many more intriguing areas. Uh, one would be, well, what's in the field? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, fields contain frequencies. You know, there's a frequency pattern in any, in any electromagnetic field. Now, as it turns out, the patterns in the heart's electromagnetic field are always shifting and changing. And when we look at what's changing them, we find that it's our emotions that are doing it. If we're feeling upset, we're feeling frustrated, you mentioned earlier in the area you live in, you're seeing fires, you know, not far from your home, 500 foot flames, and you go out there and you say, oh my God, what's going to happen <laughs> about that? You know, well, that's being imprinted in the emotions that you have in your field. Now, at the time when you were at the table with your wife this morning and you decided to focus in the heart and put out some love and some care and all that, the field changes, it becomes more coherent. And so... The emotions we're experiencing are dictating what we are actually putting into the, the frequency structure of that electromagnetic field. So a simple way of saying that is we're broadcasting our emotions out into space yeah. through the heart's field. So then in, if we look internally at this, you said the, the heart rate is or the field is always changing. What is heart rate variability? Why does it matter? Heart rate variability is a measurement and it's really cool. Um, Heart rate variability measures the timing between our heartbeats. You know, we, when we go to the doctor, the doctor takes your pulse and says, hey, guess what? You know, Michael, your, your heart rate 70 beats a minute. Well, you probably don't think about that. Uh, it, it implies that your heart is beating in a steady rhythm. It's actually never true. It's not supposed to. What the doctor told you was your heart rate averaged 70 beats during that minute. The timing between every single heartbeat changes. Um, you know, we have, if you, if you remember what an EKG looks like, and I'll do it with my fingers, you know, you have the, the big, the big spike and then it goes through a little waveform and then another spike happens, right? This is the spike where the heart's pumping out. Mm -hmm. Well, the timing between this spike and this spike can be, let's say 0.432 seconds. 
But between this next one could be something completely different, 0.568, or between the next one, 0.943. It's like it's constantly varying. Now, that variance is important because the heart needs to vary its speeds in very subtle, nuanced ways in order to pump blood properly for whatever it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so many things affect the variability. Uh, me talking right now is affecting mine. Um, movement always does when we're walking, when we're driving, when we're doing things like that. It's always affecting the variability. Now, heart rate variability, uh, from a medical standpoint, is used to measure the health of the physical heart. It's also used to measure the uh, autonomic nervous system because the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system controlling the heart rate. So they use it to measure that. Now, another measurement is around aging. Uh, I mentioned we're supposed to have a lot of variability. The more variability we have, the more width of speed that we have, the more flexibility uh, the heart has in, in pumping blood, right? So as we get older, we begin to lose that variability. And so you can look at heart rate variability and determine something about the uh, biological aging in the body. Now, all that is what traditional medicine was using heart rate variability for. Our scientists, who are now experts in this field, uh, determined that it was also a measurement of emotional state. That if you weren't moving and you weren't talking and you were simply sitting in a stationary position and you went from one emotional state to another, mm -hmm. that that variability would in fact change. And that's what happens. For instance, we can be sitting stationary and we begin to feel frustrated about something. We're starting to process an email we got that we didn't like. Well, that variability will become very incoherent very disordered, speeding up and slowing down very erratically. That will begin to happen. And you can measure that and see it. Conversely, if we're experiencing care for someone, we are with our ch child or with our grandchild or with our pet, and we feel that love, well, that heart rate variability becomes more smooth and ordered. It's speeding up and it's slowing down, but it's doing it in a more organized way, like a sine wave is what it looks like when you see the graph of it. Yeah. Now, why this is important? Well, when we create that more coherent pattern, it improves all of those functions I mentioned earlier. The signals going from heart back to brain improve. The hormone releases the heart puts out improve. All of that happens. And we enter this state, which you referred to, called coherence. Coherence is actually a, a measurable state. Its, it's scientific term is psychophysiological coherence. And it measures, you know, the synchronization taking place within the systems within the body. And when we're in a high state of coherence, we are functioning very efficiently. It's really good for our health. It also improves things like brain function, our ability to discriminate, reaction speed time, visual field. All of that is enhanced through increased coherence. So as we learn to increase coherence, it does all of that, but it also gives us the ability. And this is important. This is why it's most important, I think. It gives us the ability to better observe and then regulate our emotions. Life is all about emotion. Our thoughts don't even have much power unless there's emotion assigned to those thoughts. Yep. Um, we live in a society today where we're being bombarded by events and information. And we are having emotional reactions to every single thing that we see and hear. And as that goes on, we can become very emotionally unstable. Many people are experiencing that today, and I say that with compassion for anyone who's listening to our conversation now. It's an interesting time. It's up and down. It's all around. People can feel hopeless. They can feel they have no control. They can feel anxious. They can feel sad. They can feel depressed. These type of emotions are so prevalent in many, many people today. The good news is, is that when we learn about our heart, the qualities of the heart, and we learn about things like coherence, we can improve our ability to regulate, and I use that term intentionally, it's not suppressing, it's learning to make emotional choices in a very mature and conscious way. We can learn to make emotional choices that are more beneficial to us. We can learn to more quickly move beyond, let's say, the anxiety we're feeling into a place where we're more balanced about it all, uh, maybe even more peaceful about it all. Uh, these are skills that we can develop. And one of the main things we do at HeartMath in our training programs and through our technology is help people learn how to do that. What a great skill to have. It's, it's huge. It's, it could be everything because it means everything for our health, and we'll get there later. It means everything for the health, really, of our species as well. Before we go there, 
What is resilience and how do we begin to build it? Well, you think about resilience like this. You know, I'll use just a simple analogy. You put gas in your car, and the more gas you have in the car, the further you go. Yeah. Um, resilience is a reservoir of energy that we draw from to meet the demands of living. And there's a lot of resilience training taking place in the world today, especially in organizational cultures, corporations, things like that. And the way resilience is most often characterized is, through, is the ability to bounce back. Mm -hmm. I mean, something sort of takes you out and then resilience is what you use to bring yourself back. And that is an accurate and true characterization, in my opinion. Our approach takes it a little further, perhaps, in saying that resilience is that, but it's also a reservoir of unseen energy that we can learn to build and store. Mm -hmm. So there's more gas in the tank. So when we go, we start our day and we start with good intentions and then the events of the day begin to wear on us, we can end up at the end of the day feeling drained, burnt out, you know, those feelings of hopelessness and sadness that I mentioned earlier are certainly more dominant in what we're actually experiencing. Through the accumulation of resilience, we can do two things. First of all, we can learn to deflect some of that before it even gets to us. Mm -hmm. The more resilient we are, the more buoyant we are, the less that stuff gets us, right? If I wake up drained and then I hit the office and then I start going through the work things that I have to do and I read the emails that aren't necessarily what I want to hear, those things impact me more if I'm less resilient, right? Makes In sense. the first place. Now, the emotional choices I make during the day determine whether I'm going to add to my resilience yep. or take away from it. If I approach something through the lens of appreciation, for example, rather than complaining, I gain resilience, I gain energy. If on the other hand, I see it through the lens of what I don't have and complaining about what I don't have, I reduce the resilience. I drain energy out of that resilience accumulator. So the emotional choices we make moment to moment, day to day are determining the accumulation of resilience in our system. And it's essential because of the things I mentioned earlier. Think about the world we live in today. We have to be able to, to increase our resilience in order to meet the demands of modern living and to, to live at a place where we're living, not just to survive it and get through it, but where we're living from a place where we are enjoying it, where we are thriving, where life is an adventure rather than a burden. And so that all traces itself back to the accumulation or depletion of resilience and then taking it back a step further, that tracks all the way back to the emotions we are experiencing. And I'll loop it all the way back around to what we talked about earlier. That has everything to do with how much connection we have to the intelligence and power of our hearts. So how do we, thank you, thank you for sharing on all of that. How do we then attach and connect and get in coherence with that intelligence of the heart so we can adjust or self-regulate our emotions? Well, we do it kind of naturally in many cases, depending upon the environment that we're in. I mentioned some things earlier. Let's say we come home from work and we're a bit drained, but we're met at the front door by our pet who's always glad to see us. You know, uh, the pet jumps up and down. It's all happy. And, you know, whatever we were experiencing the day, at least for a moment in time, begins to dissipate. Right. So that's, a, that's an example of our heart coming out, you know, when we feel the love and, and exchange the love with something like a pet who's, who's got the unconditional love for us. Now. That goes on a lot for people. But what I think people need more than anything now is some structure around all that. Mm -hmm. And that's why we developed the heart mass system. Now, there are other systems that teach heart stuff, too. And we're all for it, anything, whether it's mindfulness, other heart related programs, uh, personal growth processes of all kind. We never feel competitive with any of that. We applaud all the efforts being made to uh, provide people with things that they can use to improve their life. But with heart math, we've structured it. So we've got a, sick, a, a suite of tools and techniques that you apply in various situations. Quick coherence, when you need a quick boost, when you need to move past a stressor. Attitude breathing, when you recognize that you're in an emotional state that you don't want to be in. How do you move out of that emotional state? It goes into other techniques, like the heart lock-in technique, which is a sustained heart-connected technique. It helps to build resilience. And there's decision-making tools, there's communication tools, there's planning tools. All that is part of what we teach. The reason we, we put it into structures like that is we feel like that's kind of what people need. Um, randomness and random connection to heart only gets you so far. 
uh, when you learn to do it more consciously, that's when you can evolve it. And that's when you can experience a lot of the higher benefits that are associated with that type of an approach to living. Beautiful. I'd love to touch on a couple of these techniques through the interview. The, the first one, quick coherence. I was watching beforehand. I'm checking on the weather conditions, seeing what the fire is going to do. Um, yeah. It's close enough. You want to keep an eye on it. And of course, there's this red banner saying, and I, I feel for everyone that a tornado has come through, a bunch of lives have been lost, and all of this other stuff. And I'm going, I have an interview to get to. I send all my love that I possibly can, but I need to switch my emotional state quickly. Yeah. Well, you do it through what you just said earlier. It's the very simplest of all heart math techniques. It's actually a core to many of our other techniques, just these first three steps. And then we build upon that through the technique suite that we have. But it involves three simple steps, and we can do it now eyes open even. Would love uh, and everyone listening can do it along with us, and, uh, and there's a lot of benefit from doing it together. But basically, you just shift your attention from here to here. Head to you heart, gotcha. Head to heart. You put your attention in the area in the center of the chest, not necessarily just the physical heart, but right here in the middle. You know, and, and you're doing that now. If you want to, you can put your hand there, and that helps to draw the attention that way. That's called heart focus. What you do then is you begin to breathe naturally and normally, but take deeper breaths than you normally would. And as you're doing that, you want to try to imagine as if the breath is flowing in and out through where you have your focus, the area of the heart. And this is called heart-focused breathing. So you're breathing in and out through this area in the center of your chest. So you do that for a few breaths, and then you continue with it, but you add the third and probably most important step. And that's called heart feeling. Mm -hmm. What you want to do in this step is just try to experience a regenerative, uplifting feeling. It doesn't have to be any big, mushy, gushy feeling. It can be, hey, look, you know, it's a pretty day outside. I appreciate that. Or my house isn't going to get burnt. I'm just observing the fires, you know. Uh, or it can be maybe remembering the love and care you have for someone or something in your life. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just a, a feeling of like, okay, this feels pretty good. It's a sense of well-being that you're experiencing. So you just do hard focus, hard focus breathing. Then you activate as best you can without making it a big deal, a uplifting regenerative emotion. You can do that for one minute and it, and it shifts things. It can be useful to sort of move beyond some of the, the normal sort of stressors that we experience in life not the big deals but all this little stuff that goes on every single day you know we don't have to experience that as much and the way i use a technique like that is i use it in between activities you know uh, just so the listeners know you and i did that together just for a minute or two before we actually went went live right yep. because it's your suggestion actually and you just said let's just sync up and do that we felt we'd have a better energy if both of us were hitting that next level of coherence blocking out all the other stuff that we're doing, and then you and I being together for the benefit of everyone who's listening, right? Yeah, it's, it's a tool that I use without calling it such before each interview. Maybe it dates back to my understanding of Hawaiian culture or something, but I've always wanted to lock breaths, to connect with the breath for a few breaths with myself and my guest before we start, and that puts us in this coherent state. That's right. It's good. And then you can build upon that. You know, let's, let's, I like to talk about attitude breathing a little bit. Please you know? do. Okay, attitude breathing is a technique that you can use, especially to, sh to, to shift an emotion that you're in that you don't want to really be in, right? The first step in that process is, is actually sounds so simple, but it's one people don't do. And that's to actually observe your emotions. What are you feeling? We feel our emotions when they're strong. We feel our emotions when we're really happy or really joyous. Or we feel them when we're really mad, upset, frustrated, angry. But there's a lot going on in between all of that. There's emotion happening every single moment in your life. There's a river of emotion flowing underneath all of our perceptions and consciousness. Taking a, a minute, slowing down, saying, okay, Howard, what are you feeling right now? And identifying if there's anything in there that you'd rather shift, right? Anything is preoccupying you that's creating an emotion that you don't want. Let's say I'm feeling anxious about an upcoming meeting, you know, and I would say, okay, there's an anxiousness that's going on there. I don't really want to do that. So the second step in the process is, is to choose a replacement attitude which is another term for a bundle of emotions. An attitude would be like a bundle of emotions. So it's okay. I'm feeling anxious now. I would rather feel, hmm, how about calm? 
And so I choose that replacement emotion or replacement attitude. And then as I'm doing the heart focused breathing, I'm drawing in and out the feeling of calm. Breathing the feeling specifically of calm. And I will do that long enough to where I begin at least to feel some shift out of the anxiousness. Mm -hmm. And then once I've done that a little while, then I just, you know, ask for my own core self, my own heart to anchor that. Anchor is a term just mean make it solid, make it real. Anchored in, anchor in the feeling of calm. And then I go back into my activities. Now, the anxiousness may come back up. I just redo it. Uh, if you try to use a attitude breathing when you're really, really upset, you probably won't have immediate results. Uh, but no efforts ever wasted, right? And those efforts come back and you get over something quicker uh, by making, having made the effort to practice something like that. So there's another simple technique that I've been able to share with everybody. Yeah. Quick coherence is easy enough to do anytime, anywhere. Eyes open, eyes closed while you're driving, in between meetings, before phone calls. Uh, I tell you another time to use it is before you answer that email that you don't like and wish you hadn't answered it that way. <laughs> you know, that feeling that you have right after you hit the send button and went, whoops. Yep. If you pause right there and do quick coherence a little bit, it can, it can eliminate some of those, uh, we'll just call them mistakes in communication that, uh, end up, you know, creating more trouble than, than they should. Thank you. I want to, want to touch on one more technique because I was diving into uh, one of your books earlier today, uh, more of the technical stuff, and I saw this, this uh, is it EKG readout, that just absolutely blew me away. It had your, your uh, four different levels of heartbeats. I guess the most important part is when a person did the heart lock-in technique, Everything radically changed, and all of a sudden, these lines became tick, 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 right across where they had been all up, down, and all over the place. They did heart lock-in, and it changed more than anything else. Right. It's looking at heart rate variability, probably. Yes. The graph that you saw. Yeah, because when you do that, it's like it's flipping a switch, and we, we have graphs in, in our books and things that show this thing. We have like a pattern. Here's this person. They're normal. They're frustrated. You got this jagged pattern that's happening here. Then you say, okay, now we want you to focus and do the technique like a quick coherence technique or whatever, and they do it, and all of a sudden, the pattern just begins to change. I do this live on stage. I've done it all over the world in, in big audiences and bring somebody up on stage and say, let me show you what I've been talking about. And I can have someone up on a stage in front of a thousand people and they can make that shift. And when people see that, it went from this craziness over here to the smooth and ordered over here. And they did it in that moment. It's a big aha to recognize that that's what's happening when we practice something. So it shows that these practices that we sometimes you know, have a great belief in, it, can have even a, a measurable result that you can see. And that I think is what you, what you got out of seeing that graph today. Yeah, so can, can you share, is it all right to share what the heart lock-in technique, and is that something you'd want to practice on a regular basis? Yeah, I do, because it builds that connection. It, create, it, change, it changes what, what we call a heart math, your coherence baseline. Yeah. Meaning you actually operate at a higher level of coherence naturally than you used to, right? So when you get out, the road back home is shorter. Um, now, heart lock-in is when you do something like the quick coherence technique, the same basic steps, but you then begin to radiate whatever feeling you're feeling outward. So you're radiating it out. You know, you're feeling love or compassion. Let's say you're feeling compassion for the people that are struggling in the world today. And you begin to gently radiate that out. And you do heart lock-ins for anywhere between, that, say, 5 and 50 and, and 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And as you do that with consistency, what happens is you're changing, first of all, your physiology changes. You know, that's 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 a byproduct uh, that's really beneficial. But you also are building that connection with your heart and you're operating, you're changing your coherence baseline. So you operate more coherently, more naturally and then taking it further uh, in. Less scientific. Uh, terms, you're opening yourself up for more intuition. That becomes a more natural byproduct of practicing heart lock-in. So you're contacting another type of intelligence that you have access to. Uh, heart lock-ins help to develop and refine those type processes as well.
We've had, uh, thank you, we've had Dr. Joe Dispenza on the show numerous times, and we've been talking about all of the work that he's doing, the work he's doing on stage and research. We've talked about the techniques and him using heart math and, and coherence when it comes to meditations. What can you tell us about different brainwave states and heart coherence? Well, you know, certainly brainwave states change. Joe does some great work in that regard. He's a longtime friend. He'll be here to visit me, uh, with me soon. Um, and, um, you know, the EEG is what's being measured in brainwaves. And there's the alpha, theta, you know, delta states and all of that that go on in brainwave measurements. And we've seen that there's definitely a correlation between, you know, a heart rate variability and increase in alpha and theta uh, brainwave states. Um, certainly, the combination of heart and brain is what really gives us our awareness. They're integrated systems. It's not like the one's better than the other and that they're all separate and everything. It's an integration of the two. Uh, we all, always operate that way. I think our focus has always been to say that we're not discounting any of the importance of what takes place in the brain. We're just saying that there's another side to this whole story that we we contribute to, saying that it's a combination of the two that really gives us the highest best of who we are as human beings. Beautiful. Let's go from there. You were talking earlier about other people, and I'm wondering what is global coherence? Well, global coherence is, you know, let's, let's talk about, first of all, about social coherence. Global coherence isn't going to happen without social coherence. The research endeavors we do today, that our scientists are doing today, are around social coherence. What happens uh, in groups of people? Uh, what happens in a meeting? What happens in a larger group of people? What happens in an organizational structure that's ongoing, like a big hospital where we do training and things like that? Or sports um, team. Sports team, exactly. So we're looking at, at measurements of, of social coherence. And there'll be new technology products coming out in the not too distant future that will relate to, to, to uh, collective coherence, mm -hmm. to social and, uh, coherence, not just individual coherence. Now, this is important because when we are operating as a unit, so to speak, as a group, and there's a, a higher degree of coherence going on amongst the people in that group, the effectiveness of everything is going to increase and does increase rather dramatically, right? So we have to get more social coherent. And that involves, again, the individual work we do on ourselves. Can't ever get past that. That's still most important. But then how do we relate to one another? You know, what judgments are we carrying in the workplace? You know, uh, is management judging employees or employees judging management? You know, this is the kind of thing that's going on. What type of emotional environment is happening in that meeting right there? What are we bringing forward into that meeting that could be adjusted? And would that meeting be better if it was adjusted? Uh, all those are questions that we can begin to add. The answer is yes, but we can add scientific validity to all of that through the understanding of social coherence. Measuring the changes occurring physiology, uh, physiologically in those various situations. Now, we expanded that into trying to understand what we call global coherence. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a collective consciousness happening in the world. There's seven point something billion of us on the planet now. Everybody's got a heart. Everybody's got a brain. Everybody's got emotions. Everybody's got thought. All of those emotions, all those thoughts are imprinting the energetic fields that we are producing as individuals. Now, with seven point some billion of us, what does that mean from a global standpoint? And so to look at that, we began to look at um, the Earth's energetic systems. Now, planet Earth has an energetic, energetic fields. We have the geomagnetic field. It's a, an energetic field created by the spinning of the iron core at the center of the Earth. There's also um, what's called the ionosphere, which is a less dense field that starts just above the last part of our atmosphere and goes another 120 miles or so up into space. These two fields exist around our planet. They are part of the Earth. Think about them like as an energetic ecology. They are the protective layers around our planet that protects the world from incoming space weather, solar winds, cosmic rays, things like that. If the fields didn't exist, nothing that we would associate with life would be here. It'd be a rock. So these fields are very important. Now, the fields are always changing. Uh, they are always fluctuating. There's been a ton of research already done and more ongoing, correlating changes in human health and behavior with changes that occur in these fields. The primary modulator of the fields is actually changes occurring in the sun. As solar activity uh, changes, it impacts the geomagnetic and ionospheric fields. Those fields, in turn, impact things like brain function, physical health, decision making. Um, societally, they impact things like um, the start and ending of wars, increases in traffic accidents, hospital admissions, all kinds of stuff happen uh, in relationship to those field changes. Now, we study that. 
And to do that, we created an organization as part of our nonprofit. There's two sides to HeartMath, and everyone probably needs to know that. There's the HeartMath.com, HeartMath Inc., which is the for-profit company uh, that sells the, the products and a lot of the training programs and things like that. And then the nonprofit, HeartMath Institute, which is HeartMath.org, which is where the scientific research is done and where programs for some programs for organizations, but also families and children and schools and the military and things like that take place. Now, the nonprofit, we started a, a division of that a number of years ago called the Global Coherence Initiative. Yep. And we set this up so we could bring people together from all around the world using our heart focused care and our intentions really to help shift the planet, right? Shift this discord and chaos and confusion into more harmony, cooperation, and more enduring peace. So we do that through, you know, having things people can do, meditations they can do, and things like that. But we also added the scientific component to it. Our scientists, working in conjunction with other space scientists, yep. created very sensitive technology that can, can measure changes occurring in the Earth's fields. And we've been deploying global coherence monitoring sites around the planet. Uh, there are a number of them now. There's, I'll tell you where they are. There's one in Northern California where we're located. Mm -hmm. There's one in Northern Canada. These are strategically located to measure these fields. There's one in Lithuania. There's one in Saudi Arabia. There's another site in uh, New Zealand, another one in South Africa. One will be... Uh, put up soon in the country of Colombia, and eventually we will want about 12 of these. And they're measuring changes occurring in the fields. And they're sending all this data back to our research labs. Now, we're doing it for three reasons. One is to contribute to the academic literature on the understanding of the fields themselves. Two, to, further, to do further research on understanding the effect the fields are having on us. And the third one is to test a hypothesis. Hypothesis is this is if these fields are affecting us, that maybe we are also affecting them. Yeah. That mass human emotion, whether positive or not positive, is creating enough energy that is impacting the Earth's fields and in turn influencing how those fields affect us. So we're testing that hypothesis. It's a long-term project. You can just go to the nonprofit site if you want, heartmath.org. You click on the Global Coherence tab. You can see all this. You can become a member for free. Just join Global Coherence Initiative and you become part of this group of people from literally over 120 countries uh, that are members and become part of this grand experiment. It, it's fascinating. And, and I've thought of Schumann resonance for a long time. I've thought of the frequency of the earth. But until you said it today, I never occurred to me. What you're talking about is heart rate variability of the planet. That's correct. We're measuring, the, as we say sometimes, we're measuring the heartbeat and the brain waves of the planet. Woohoo! <laughs> there you go. So let, let's talk about a few more practices that we can do to help with our hearts, to help. Actually, let's talk about vibration frequency and okay. our heart. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, everything has to do with vibration frequency. I mean, we're our consciousness, our mind and emotions are vibrating in different frequencies. And we hear this all the time about good vibes, bad vibes, about people that do spiritual work talking about the vibrations. And there are things like those bowls that people have, and there's there's chants people do and all to increase vibration. And vibration determines the vibration we're operating in determines our perceptions. If I'm in a low vibe place, then the world looks a certain way to me. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a higher vibration, it looks different, right? And the whole perception of life, of myself, of others, of everything is changing uh, in relationship to the vibration that I'm operating in. So one of the things that heart math techniques do is they help to raise those, that vibration. We don't always characterize it that way, but that's one of the things that's actually happening. Is when we get heart, brain, and body in sync, it raises the vibratory rate in the mind and emotions. Taking that further, it actually changes the vibrational rate in our consciousness itself. Awareness changes. We access more of who we truly really are. We begin to uh, resonate more with the field of information that's called intuitive. We begin to have more intuitive insight, uh, which influences our ability to discriminate. All this happens when we, when we raise the vibratory rate. So in some of the programs that we do, we do have a module on that. We do one in Mexico every year. It's a big heart math annual event. Anybody can go to it, but it's an annual event we do it's a, where we have myself, Dr. Roland McCready, Director of Research, Dr. Deborah Rosman, psychologist and CEO of HeartMath. We all present, and there's a module we do every year in that program on raising our vibratory rate, on changing our pitch. 
Uh, and to do that, there's a technique very simple again. You first of all have to stop. You have to slow down. Yeah. You have to go somewhere quiet for a minute. This is not one you just do on the fly. You know, you have to pull out of the fray for a little bit and go somewhere. You look at your vibratory rate and you look at whatever's going on like you're watching a TV show. Uh, if you're watching a TV show that's unappealing, what do you do? You change the channel, you know. And so in this context, you just imagine as if you're dialing in a more uplifting channel. You know, you got this negative down slant thing going on and you recognize this is a lower vibration. I'm griping and complaining. Life is looking miserable to me. You want to say, OK, that's a show I'm watching. So you're disassociating in a way by saying that you're saying, OK, I'm watching the show of this person who's experiencing this. You backing off from it. You say, I'm going to change it to a more appealing uh, station. And you begin to sort of dial in a more uplifting feeling, more hopeful, more open ended, uh, more excited, more adventurous about life. And you begin to try to look at that show. And then as you breathe that, you begin again to anchor that in until you begin to feel the vibration shift a little bit. And so we can learn to modulate these internal vibrations. It happens anyway. I guess a better way of saying that, Michael, is we can learn to more consciously. Yeah modulate these vibrations in ourselves. And as we do, we co-create a new and different life because the perceptions and the vibrations that we're in are working in a co-creative process uh, that determine what our life really is. And so as we make these shifts moment to moment, day to day, they string together over time and over a relatively short amount of time, but certainly over longer periods, the movie of life begins to change. We co-create a different movie in our own lives by learning to modulate the vibratory rate in our own consciousness. I, I absolutely love it. And real briefly, because we're, we're running short on time, I have so much, everybody's going to have to go over to your website, check it all out. But it, it gets me thinking of people who say, what do I do? People keep treating me a certain way. And it occurs to me that if we get more in coherence ourselves, if we change the vibration that we are at, we change the way that people interact with us because they're reading our field as well as us reading theirs. That's right. We magnetize different scenarios into our life. Some of those people can go away, but it doesn't always mean that that'll happen. Two things can occur. One is we will begin to create uh, less of that in our lives where people are not treating us well. In addition to that, we also develop the internal ability, the resilience, the ability to regulate emotions to where that stuff has less effect on us. Because one of the byproducts of making that connection with our heart is we develop a new and more powerful connection with who we truly are. And that gives us more self-security. So whatever about what they do, you know, we still have the ability to maintain our balance and our poise and our dignity and our maturity in the middle of all that. And as we do that more and more, yes, in fact, the petty tyrants will often go away and we begin to be treated in a new and different way uh, more often than we were before. Well, awesome. And on that note, you mentioned a key, key phrase, who we truly are. This makes me think of our kids today. What do you want to tell us about our kids and heart coherence? The kids that are ha they're living today are living in a world unlike anything we ever lived in. You're younger than me, Michael, but certainly in my generation, uh, the hand-me-down ways in which we've dealt with children are no longer effective. Uh, they are in, they are, are vibrating in a different frequency. They are experiencing life through a lens that's sometimes difficult to us to see through because it is different. We need to give them more love, more care, more kindness, and more allowance. And as, a, as an act of care, we need to teach them more about how to understand and regulate their emotions. That's one of the things that they suffer from the most is they don't know how to deal emotionally with what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. Give them the gift of love and care from your heart to theirs by helping them understand their emotions and how to better deal with them. That's the greatest gift I know you could give a child today. So I like geeking out on technology. Years ago, I was writing articles for ADD ma magazines and publication. I tested Wild Divine. Now I've heard of M-Wave and Inner Balance. What are these tools we can use to actually check out our heart rate variability and yeah. do something about it? Yeah, they're coherence building tools that use heart rate variability as a measurement. They're based on a patented algorithm determining how coherent the heart rate variability is in any moment in time. So the user's training tools are very powerful. The inner balance trainer operates on mobile devices, any Android device, pad or phone. You get a sensor, you buy the sensor from HeartMath and you, you run the, the app that you download uh, for free on your mobile device. 
M-Wave Pro is a desktop version of that technology used by professionals. Uh, there's also a handheld unit called M-Wave 2, which is like, it is portable, but it does it's not a phone or a tablet, and that's for people that don't like to use phones or tablets. So we have all three for people. They're coherence building technologies. They're very effective and very powerful. I'm going to send you one. I'm going to send you an inner balance trainer uh, sensor that you can use for yourself, and you can try it out. I know we uh, are running out of time. Um, I'm enjoying the conversation. I suggest we do it again and not take as long as we did between the last time we did. Oh, you've got it. You absolutely have got it. So let me wrap up with just a few quick questions. Jessica, she's got to ask this question about mother and baby and kitty cats or animals and people. Well, we certainly have seen, you know, that uh, doing simple research that you can see uh, uh, the heartbeat of a baby being picked up in the brainwave of the mother. That's one thing you can see. We've done things with animals to where we've shown the coherence between animals uh, and people. Uh, Josh and Mabel is a story of a boy and a dog that love one another. Uh, both have their heart rate variability measured. The boy walks into the room, doesn't touch the dog. Intentional experiment. Uh, as he walks into the room, he and the dog both go into high coherence simultaneously. We have a graph of this. Uh, we've seen that same type of study replicated with horses. Mm -hmm. uh, a woman in Southern California sitting outside the corral, sending love to horses. Uh, the horse's heart rate variability is being measured. Hers is being measured as she gets to high state of coherence, so do the horses. Uh, so we know there's an energetic transfer. This can be the subject of, a, of our next conversation maybe about Perfect. another side of heart math we didn't get into today, which is energetic connectivity happening between all living systems which is an important part of our social coherence research and beyond and understanding the energetics involved in connection between everything, between all living systems on this planet and beyond. Love it, love it, love it. So where can people go to find out more? Go to heartmath.com. I would suggest one thing um, is right now between uh, now and the end of July, mm -hmm. uh, there is a sale running 20% off. And I didn't say that to make a sales pitch, but it's in fact true and I would feel miss if I didn't inform people about that. Uh, a great first step I would consider for anyone listening that hasn't taken a step yet is become an ad heart facilitator. It's a simple course. You get the technology with it. You take the course online. It's six short modules, 15 minutes each. You learn a heart math technique. You learn some science. You learn about the technology. You practice with it, and then you learn how to share it. And when you're done, you become an approved ad heart facilitator and you enter into the family of trained people all around the world. Just call ad heart facilitator, find them on heartmath.com. If you want more science and research, and if you want to understand more about how to help children, things like that, go to heartmath.org. You can become a member of the HeartMath Institute. I encourage you to do that as well. And you can become a member of Global Coherence Initiative. So there's plenty to do at HeartMath. Just go to heartmath.com and heartmath.org and check it out. Fantastic. And any last words of wisdom or really brief homework assignment you give people to tune into their heart? Yep. I would like to say this. Please have compassion for yourself. Uh, it's interesting, challenging times. We're going to have ups. We're going to have downs. Don't beat up on yourself about that. Uh, have that compassion. Give yourself the gift that your heart's trying to give you. Be compassionate with you and practice that. Next till the next time that we run into one another, wherever that is, and however we do it, I'd like you to find times in your life to when you feel as if you haven't done good enough, you're not good enough, you're not getting it, all those type of feelings, and to remember what I said today and say, you don't have to really go there. What you can do instead is to focus your attention in the area of the heart. You can say, it's okay. I'm having a tough moment right now. Everything is all right. I'm a good person doing the best I can. Have that compassion for yourself. Radiate it to every single cell in your body. Give yourself that gift and raise your vibration and then send that compassion to anything else that's around you. That's your homework assignment. Woohoo! This has been awesome, Howard. We are definitely going to have you back and sooner than later, I would love, okay. love, love to continue this conversation. Well, thanks for today. It's been fun and I hope everybody listening has had a good time with us and uh, wish you all the best until we're together again. Awesome. Take awesome. Care. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get heart intelligence and begin getting into heart coherence today and shine bright. Take care. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Howard. You rocked it. Thank you so, so much. That rock, that rock, Michael. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also leave your comments, have some real fun with it. 
subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>